This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got big Phil Campion. Phil, how are I'm we? Here. Yeah, long time coming. Long time. It's coming, a long time. It's a few years in the making. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. But we're here. Yeah. We're, in, we're in West London. Aren't we? yeah, yeah. West London yeah. Fascinating story. <laughs> um, SES. You've been all over the world. You've written books. Been on TV shows. Bit of a mad bastard, but people love you. And uh, I can see why you've got that big... I'll do all right. I'll do all right, mate. You know what I mean? We're not, I'm not out of the woods yet. But... <laughs> like I say, mad story, book offer. Um, you're very well liked. You're everywhere. But before we get into all the madness, I always like to go back to the start with my guest, Phil. Yeah. Get more a bit of an understanding about you. That's, that, that's where the madness starts, yeah. to be honest. My childhood, insane. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, and I learned so many lessons from my childhood. And I think one of the biggest lessons I learned in my childhood was... No matter how rough things get, so long as there's air going into your lungs, you've got a chance. And I say that because my old man used to beat the granny out of me. I mean, proper, sit on my chest and hit me. And I remember thinking to myself once, if I wriggled, he went mad. He'd, he'd carry on hitting me, do you know what I mean, if I wriggled. And I remember laying underneath him thinking, right, if I stop, if I can control it, if I can... And the beating stopped. And all of a sudden I thought, hang on, I'm controlling this now. And that was a win, a small win, the tiniest win you've ever had. But it's a positive from a negative. And that's that's one lesson from my childhood. And it's it's good you've started there because that's where the making of the man is, isn't it? From his childhood. Yeah, that's you, your foundations. You tend to see a lot of the kids I speak to, a lot of the men I speak to who were ex-military come from, broken homes, abuse. I, it's something like 70%. I, and I don't know exactly, but I have heard 70% of the guys in, in my regiment, in the SAS, come from some sort of background where they've had a little bit of a nonsense in their early early years. Like, do you know what I mean? What age did it start with you? Um, <laughs> from birth, really, because uh, I was born, adopted straight out, so I was wheeled straight out away from the family, taken away from my mother. Um, my adopted parents came up from Southampton. Uh, they, they took me away from London in a motorbike and sidecar. he just lost his job, so he was Mr Angry from the off-light, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that was it. That was straight into this adopted family that I don't think really... They had a picture in their minds of what they wanted, but they didn't want it when they got it. Like, do you know what I mean? So they, they now had two adopted children, both young. He didn't have work anymore. She was supposed middle class, but we live in a council estate. Do you know what I mean? So they, there was ambition there from her, but nothing from him. He didn't care. He was a drinker. Like, do you know what I mean? And the kids just got in the way in the end, and that was it. Do you know what I mean? It was, it, it, I don't know, just you survived, didn't you? You survived as a kid. Did you ever meet your real dad? No, and he's the only person on the planet I wanted to meet, and I can I can honestly say that if you said to me I could I could meet anyone in the world, it would be my real dad, and I never met him, and I missed him for about three or four months because I found my real family eventually, and yeah, it was it was quite a bad story, but I, I found my real family eventually. Unfortunately, my dad had passed on, so yeah, I never got to meet my dad, and that, that's my that's my biggest bugbear in life. I think I never met my dad. 
Was there ever any answers to why you were let go? Yeah, it was that it was that sixties thing. My mum already had my older brother. He was living with my nan. She got pregnant again. It was unspoken in them days, wasn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like, off you go, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And and off I went. And that was it. You know, I think from what my aunties said, you know, they tried to keep me. One of them said that. But look, I'll tell you now. When I met, when I first met them, I have not got enough time on this planet to do the things I want to do. Let alone going back and churning all that shit up. Do you know what I mean? So I couldn't be. I couldn't be done with it. Do you know what I mean? What is the point in digging all that back up? So I, I didn't ask the questions. And my mum, my real mum, now has sadly passed on. So I won't get those answers. But I don't want them. Do you know what I mean? I, everything on my body is designed to go that way, not that way. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? When did you find out your step parents weren't your real parents? From from birth, so I was always told. Do you know what I mean? I remember actually, me mum, <laughs> me mum coming in, and, and, and this is a very early memory. My adopted mum coming in and going, right, okay, all the other kids at school, mum, dad, right, and the, 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 yeah, you, mum, dad, but you came from here. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm like, what, what? <laughs> and I remember explaining it to me, and I'm like. Wow, okay, so I'm not really yours, but I am yours because I live with you. You are my mum and dad. I call you mum and dad, but you're not my mum and dad. And it actually, I didn't even think about it further than that. Like, you know what I mean? You're like, oh, well, okay, I'm adopted. And then we, but my mum used to get really upset because whenever she introduced me to people after that, I was like, yeah, I'm adopted. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> See, when you knew you were adopted and still getting your beatings, did it ever think of you're not my real dad you shouldn't be doing that or no, did you just no because accept to me that? he was my real dad that that was my dad as far as i was concerned i i didn't really understand i didn't get the i didn't get the whole concept of all the all the adoption stuff do you know what i mean so he was my dad i couldn't understand why he was doing it but i understood that i could control it by going limp and pretending that he'd knock me out or whatever do you know what i mean because he, he would panic he literally if he thought he'd knock me out or something but he'd know it had gone too far like do you know what i mean yeah what about skilling Nightmare at school, absolute nightmare. All, all my tribulations. I had the attention span of a goldfish, you know. I think, mean, like, where's it gone? Like, you know what I, mean? I, I didn't care at school. I did, and I couldn't. Do you know what my biggest problem at school was? I couldn't see where any of it was going to fit into my life. I couldn't. Why do I need to know that? I don't need to know that. I don't want to know that. Do you know what I mean? I don't care. Well, I, I only need a spell. I can speak. Do you know what I mean? Who cares? So I had this attitude at school where I, I genuinely didn't care, and it was probably wrong. You know, I do try and encourage people to do as well as they can with whatever they're doing, but it's not for everybody. And the other thing I try and tell people now is just because you're a complete failure at school, and I was a failure at school, do you know what I mean? I got expelled from two, I got thrown out, I left with a cycle proficiency, I took that twice, do you know what I mean? But just because it doesn't mean you're a failure in life, does it? Do you know what I mean? So you, th th there's always something for everybody. There'll be something that you're good at. And I wasn't good at sitting in a classroom and being spoken to and doing that i couldn't do it do you know what i mean so you know i was better at other things i could play football half decent i could do this i could do that but sit in that classroom now nah, not for me there's the beatings because you know yourself anybody who gets beat or bullied can go either two ways either they become the bullier themselves or they then sit back and become sheepish did you become angry towards the world no i think i think it done it done two things to me i understood what a beating was do you know what i mean so if i had a fight with someone at school i understood that i was going to hurt them do you know what I mean? It wasn't It wasn't one of these, oh, no, 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 no. If I engage in violence, somebody is going to get hurt. It might be me, but if I engage in violence, somebody is going to get hurt. And I understood that. I knew about violence. and understood how to control it to a certain extent. I knew when to step off, knew when to go forwards. Do you know what I mean? And it was lessons a, a child shouldn't learn, really, to be honest. But I knew them. Did you ever ask your stepdad <laughs> the answers why he'd done what he'd done? No, do you know what? I met him years later. He was in a right old mess. He was in a bed sit. No money, nothing. Life in tatters. No car, no money, no job. Dying, laid on a bed. Overweight. On his last legs. And I thought, you know, I could raise all that now, couldn't I? Do you know what I mean? You know, probably have a little go back. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? Do you know what I mean? And I, you know, I remember just before he died, I had, I had a little bit of a conversation with him. Do you know what I mean? Don't take it with you, mate. Don't take it personally. I don't, do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not going to bring all that up. It, it, no point, is there? Like I said, there's not enough time on this planet for the stuff that you like mm -hmm. and, and to start digging. So I just, you know, I've met him a couple of times. And my intention was, I'm going to be honest, my intention was when I went around there, was to have it out with him. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And when I saw him, I thought, what's the point? What is the point? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, you've got to close your eyes for the last time knowing what you did. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's your punishment as far as I'm concerned. Did you ever know his backstory? Because to, to be like that comes from I don't think he had a great behaviors. time. I don't think he had a great time. You know, he, he was obviously brought up towards the tail end of a war. 
his old man was quite harsh and strict with him. Do you know what I mean? He had a few problems, which is why we was adopted in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So he couldn't have he couldn't have children. I think that weighed heavily on his mind that he wasn't a wasn't a full man. Do you know what I mean? And all that sort of stuff. So there, 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 there was undoubtedly some, some some something underlying that made him like that. Do you know what I mean? I was born like that, are they? Do you know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. Something makes you like that, okay? But I don't know. I, I I never got to the bottom of it. And to be fair, I never even bothered with it because, like I say, once he'd left, he'd left. We didn't really see him. And it came to light later on in life that he wasn't very well. And I thought, look, I'll go and see him and just see if I can ask him. And I'll just, when I saw him, I thought, what's the point? No point. How much do you think that moulds a kid to an adult to then a person, the stuff that they go through? Do you think that's what made you as tough as you are going through everything I think you went through? It definitely does. It definitely does. It, that's your foundations. It's like a building, isn't it? The stuff you put down first, the stuff you learn first, is what you're going to put everything else on for the rest of your life. Do you know what I mean? So everything I've got was built from being that child. Do you know what I mean? So all the stuff I learned, the violence that I was exposed to and all that sort of stuff has all made me the person that I am. Do you know what I mean? And I can take good and bad from that. So I've not been a perfect person. I have been quite violent. I've been unnecessarily violent a couple of times in my life. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've got off on it. I'll tell you that. You know, I used to love fighting. I still do like fighting. I box now. Do you know what I mean? So I can have a fight and not get in trouble. But I still like fighting. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, that's all been instilled in me since I was, since I was that big. Do you, know do you what I mean? think you would have always been that way? Or do you think it's learnt behaviours from your stepdad? No, I think, and, and this is a really interesting question, because being adopted, I was nothing like my adopted parents, nothing like them at all. I had nothing in common with them, really, in the way that I was, the way I behaved. Um, yet when I met my real parents, you could see similarities in between me and, say, my uncles. Like, you know, they were boisterous. My, my uncles on my mother's side, they're proper boisterous blokes. You know, I mean, they're blokes, blokes. They, you know, they're, they're out, you know, a couple of them have done a bit of bird and all that. Do you know what I mean? They're geezers. And I was more like them. And even my behaviour that shone through was more like them. So I think... It's probably a six and two freeze. I think you're born with a lot of this stuff, but you also learn a lot of this stuff on the way, don't you? Do you know what I mean? In your DNA. Yeah. What happens when you left school? Um, right, yeah, good question. So I, 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 I didn't complete schooling. I got picked up when I was about 13 years old and they identified that I was quite clever. I had quite a high IQ. They did those little bubble test things with me. So they, I had a, And so they sent me paid to, paid to, to this public school. But I didn't really fit in because all these kids have been there all their lives. You know what I mean? They all spoke with a plum in their cobs. And that, you know, and I'm not that bloke. You know what I mean? So I turns up. I haven't got the school uniform. Everyone's got their trousers taken in. I've got flares on. Do you know what I mean? They didn't have no money. They all have money. And I didn't really massively fit in. Although, you know, I have visited the school since and spoken to them. I've actually spoken at the school. But at the time, I was quite bullied, to be honest, because of the background that I had, of where I'd come from. I just felt I didn't fit in. And it's not an excuse for my behaviour because I was a, I was I was a twat, like, you know what I mean. But yeah, I, so I left school early. I ended up in this small education unit in the New Forest in a, in a children's home, and I just binned it. I'm like, well, what 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 is the point? What am I going to get from this? So I completely sacked it. I used to I used to run away from the children's home. I used to hide in the New Forest. I used to go live by the river. I used to pull fish out, go poaching and all that sort of stuff. And just, I, I just became almost sort of like semi feral. You know what I mean? I was just doing my own thing, and I loved that. I thought that was great. You know? What was the children's home like? Brilliant. Loved it. Beautiful. I, what was I beautiful that, about that? Just being able to do your own thing sometimes, you know what I mean? Because did you feel free there? I did feel free, yeah, because although the staff sort of like rotated in and out, you weren't beholden to them all the time. And I could almost come and go as I pleased. Like, But here's the really strange thing. That's where I first became exposed to sexual predators. You know, I got... I got groomed by a fucking guy, for want of a better word. Do you know what I mean? It never actually came to touch him, but suggestive stuff was done. Bits were brought out in front of me that I shouldn't see as a kid and all that sort of thing. And it was honking. But even that, to me, was better than what I was, where I was, you know, when I was, when I was, when I was living at my adopted mother's house. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I felt this sort of like freedom that actually you couldn't go any further than the kids. I'm all right. You could probably get logged up. Like, do you know what I mean? But I got, I could now almost do what I wanted. Do you know what I mean? And I felt, I genuinely felt like that in the kill time. Do you know what I mean? If I didn't want to do something, I didn't do it. I didn't go to school. What triggered you? What was your trigger points to make you angry, make you vicious? Um, again, that, I've got, a, I've got a really short, I used to have, I'm not so bad now, but I used to have a really, really short fuse with everybody. Do you know what I mean? Just things wouldn't go my way. Or I could get really frustrated if I didn't 
get something I wanted. And that sounds really spoiled, doesn't it? But I could be sort of like, I don't know. If I, I could be, as a young kid, I could be really sort of like jealous as well. Like, do you know what I mean? And jealous, green eyed monster is a horrible thing. Do you know what I mean? But if a kid got something and I thought, well, I didn't get that. Why didn't I get that? I should have had that. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like, do you know what I mean? I don't know. It, it, yeah. So, I mean, that wouldn't trigger me to violence necessarily, but. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza. The fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. You had to step over the lines if you if you wanted me to, if, if, if I was going to engage, because I understood where violence led to, someone getting hurt, and, you know, that, that's not pleasant. You had to engage with me, do you know what I mean, for me to go over those lines of violence. What do you think you craved the most as a kid? Love. Yeah, love. Just, do you think that's where the anger comes from? Maybe I think it probably does a little bit. I, I never really, do you know what I mean? I remember, I remember just trying to sit down next to my mum once and she sort of like slid me off like, we adopted mum, do you know what I mean? I'm like, right, yeah, that was nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? Dude, I had an adopted sister, I didn't get on with her. We just, we just were different kids. Do you know what I mean? So I didn't have any, I didn't have any real what you would call love. Do you know what I mean? Like I love my kids unconditionally, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for my kids. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't feel that I ever had that from an adult when I was when I was young. The other thing I never had was, and I say this a lot with with a lot of young people I see now, I never had a role model. I never had anybody I looked up to and went, I "Want to be like him?" Because mm -hmm. my old man was a complete, just a bully and a drunk and a coward. Do you know what I mean? The school teachers I came across didn't really, they were just school teachers. Members of staff I came across were nonces, do you know what I mean? I came across nonces in the kids' homes. So adults to me really were sort of like, do I really want to be like any of you? No, I don't. Do you know, and it wasn't until I joined the army that, you know, I remember meeting my first um, section commander, and I won't say his name on here because he might not want his name said on here, but my first section commander, a full screw, big man, won a medal. Do you know what I mean? He had, he had, and I'm like, I want to be like him. <laughs> you know, like, wow, he's a proper geezer. Do you know what I mean? He, he, he gives you a slap on the back if you've done well. He gives you a slap in the face if you've done well. Do you know what I mean? He, he was a proper man. He, he, he told you how it was. There was no mince in his words. Do you know what I mean? What he said went. Ain't it mad, Phil, that all we ever want is to feel loved? Yeah. Anybody yeah, crazy. on this planet. Everything I'm the same now. I'm the same yeah. now. Do you know what I mean? I, I, you know, I, I went through, you know, been through one relationship. I love my relationship with me now. I love Wendy. I love my kids. Do you know what I mean? I love my dog. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I love my dog. <laughs> but I love, and my dog loves me. Yeah. <laughs> we're simple. We are simple creatures. Men, we're very, we make things complicated because we don't know how to show emotion, feeling. And sometimes it's, you don't have to be, I think the world is becoming soft. You don't want to be all emotional and soft all the fucking time. You've got to be a bit tough. It's more forgiving than what it was. I mean, it, it, there was a thing where if I, I, I dread to think if I cried in the kids' home in front of anybody, and I'd bite my lip till it fell off, do you know what I mean? But rather than cry in front of anybody, now I'll blub at the first opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, that's all we crave is... I think a lot. that's why a lot of men struggle as well, a lot of suicide, because they're abandonment, never feeling good enough, never feeling there's always pressure, no matter... I think there is, there is pressure on you to be a man, and a man's... And I do get that, because you do need to be a man, don't you? Yeah, you know I mean? you definitely. Do, you are the hunter-gatherer of the family. I don't, and I, I don't care for all this newfangled stuff, do you know what I mean, where you're this, that, and the other. No, 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 no. You, as far as I'm concerned, and the way I view it, is you are the provider for my family, do you know what I mean? All right, Wendy, Wendy does her bits and pieces, but primarily I see myself as holding, you know providing for my family and my, and my children do you know what I mean and I take that very seriously yeah do you know what I mean it is, it is, it is a role that is, is you're born with it aren't you do you yeah. know what I mean so it's natural instincts yeah. that's your first protocol provide yeah. and protect it's yeah. old school like yeah. I wouldn't even say it's old school a lot more people are starting to waking up to it I think you can get brainwashed with all the shit it's all about obviously no harm to anybody what sex you are or who you are no, well, obviously yeah, you've got yeah. a film one for like pride and stuff like so be it but for the straight man there's fuck all for us there's nothing for us it's, if, if it's, you see it, anything you know, you're I get the bad called, man I get, I've been called a gammon on my social media he's a gammon <laughs> I'm not sure I'm that, you know? I'd laugh that off do you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> but I'm in a group, aren't I? Everybody's in a group of some sort, aren't they? Yeah. You could label everybody if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. I, I don't go down. I, I, each to his own. Do what you got to do. Be yeah. who you got to be. But I am who I am. 
And please respect that as well. Do you know and what I mean? I think that's the way it should be. Everybody's different. Just be yeah. respectful. Everybody yeah, just don't yeah. throw it down their face. That's that and go on mm. with your life. What was the decision to join the army? Was it escape uh, or was it something? Backed into a bit of a corner, really. I got a job on the YTS, which was a youth training scheme, and the government backed scheme. We used to earn 25 and i got a job as a ski instructor on it and i thought yeah, this is this is awesome could you I ski worked, yeah 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 through the kids zone we used to go to this dry slope and i was teaching on this dry slope and i thought yeah i've got nailed this great skier do you know what i mean i thought nailed this i've got a job for life here come to the end of me two years went for an interview with a boss and i said what's going on here then he, he called me in and he said what are you doing when you leave here and i'm not going okay, well, to go leave here i ain't leaving <laughs> yes you are son he says you've got no qualifications he goes you have to be a teacher to be here you know you have to have something a bit more than just been able to ski and that was like a real come to jesus moment for me i was like oh and he turned around to me and he said have you ever thought about the, the armed forces and i went i have because when i was at that public posh school they had a ccf and actually when i was in the combined cadet force i felt like i fitted in because everybody had to have the same uniform every and i was quite good because i was fit so because I was fit, I could keep up with all the stuff that they were doing. And I, and I, I, I so I just said to him straight away, as soon as he said the army, I went, yeah, I'll have a go at that. He, he literally picked the phone up to the careers office there and then phoned him up. He said, we've got someone coming down to see you tomorrow morning. He got a minibus for me, took me down there the next morning. Literally, I walked in there, big old sergeant from some guards unit, you know what I mean? Barking and yelling and walking around. I thought, yeah, I'll have some of that, you know what I mean? And that was it. Signed up. I, you know, as soon as I could get in, I got in. How old were you? Um, I was... I must have been about 17 and a half because I actually joined up when I was 18. It didn't take me long to get in at all. I'd thought about it when I was 16, but I had a junior a junior criminal record. So I'd, I'd had a couple of tear-ups in town and that mm. sort of like prohibited me from getting in the army straight away. But because I kept my nose clean for a couple of years on the YTS, when I came off of that, they were like, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, I tried to join the Marines when I was 18. Yeah. Passed the test, you do like a written test and then I think it's six weeks in a Catholic maybe. But I ended up fucking wrecked and, and missing it. I wonder how my life would be if I joined that. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Uh, but I met a marine in the nightclub and it was it it was fucking just a big strong guy. And I'd felt my life was slipping with the football and stuff. And I'd done the test. I went to the test hungover. And then they were sending us away. I think I was at Catrick somewhere, six weeks for training. And I thought I bottled it. <laughs> yeah. Fucking bottom. We're both sat in the same room yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just love the fact of the fitness and the strict and and I needed guidance then. Do you know what I really felt? So the guy that was the sort of like perpetrator of the nonsense, as I call it, like do you know what I mean? The geezer that was the the, the, the one behind it. He sort of like followed me even when I was working on this on this job because he used to go down to the activity centre as well. So he was working down there as well. And I felt like I can't get away from you. Like, do you know what I mean? When I joined the army, I literally got on a bus, got to the train station, got on a train, went all the way up to Litchfield, got off the train. I'm miles away from anybody now. When I got picked up by that lorry and got on the back of the lorry, big green old four-tonner Bedford type lorry, and we drove him through that camp. I remember the gate coming up. I thought, you ain't going to get me in here, son, are you? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I actually felt safe. For the first time in my life, I felt safe and I felt accepted. Do you know what I mean? And I genuinely felt accepted. Do you know what I mean? You've, you've, I'm in here because I've, I've earned my place here. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I was determined to, to finish that training and become a soldier because I, I truly believe that that was, that was now my family. How could you learn how to trust with everything you've been through? Did you feel that? I don't think I'd ever trust anybody fully. I don't think, you know... Were you nervous though, going in, seeing the sergeants, big men, strong men? Or were you I was, feeling yeah. at peace? No, I was nervous. Oh. But, you know, I need to, you know... There was still was a little bit of discipline in those days, wasn't there? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you weren't going to be shy of a backhand if you was a complete idiot, like, do you know what I mean? And, you know, when you've got a group of males in those days, probably still now to a certain extent, you can expect some alpha behaviour from people, can't you? Do you know what I mean? You ain't going to get... You, you're going to, you, there's going to be a backing order, isn't there? There, there, there? there naturally is with all this sort of stuff. So you knew that there was going to be possibly some confrontation, possibly find your place in the ladder, but I didn't worry about all that. Do you know what I mean? Because I knew my limitations. And I knew I, I thought I knew myself well enough. And the army, the army brought me to life. It really did. It, it, the army brought me completely to where I should be. Was that the first time you felt as if you had a family? Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, it, the role model within the, the the corporals and you know, especially the one corporal because he was he was almost <laughs> he'd laugh if he'd laugh if I called him a father figure now. Do you know what I mean? But I looked at him almost like that. Do you know what I mean? He was something that I aspired to be like. You know, and I looked at him and I thought, you know, I'd have loved to play football for England, but I was shit. So, you know, I was now doing this. I was now going to be a soldier. And he was a fucking good soldier. Do you know what I mean? And I wanted to be like him.
What makes a good corporal or a good sergeant? He could do what he, he could do what he was said on the tin. Do you know what I mean? So he, if there was a task, if there was an eight miler, if there was whatever it was you were going to do, he could do it. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't going to stand there and go, "I'll run up that hill that he couldn't run up." He was going up that hill first, like do you know what I mean? So he led by example. He could do everything he said and more. Do you know what I mean? So I think he looked at him thinking, "Yeah, if I could be somewhere whereabouts you are, I ain't going to struggle here, am I?" Do you know what I mean? Because I'll be like you. And, I, and and that was it. And that was that's how a role model works, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? What was the training league back then? Uh, tough, tough, tough for me. You know, lots of discipline, lots of screaming, lots of shouting, lots of folding, lots of ironing, lots of polishing, lots of cleaning. But you used to that though, did that? Yeah. See I what you went through as a kid with all that shouting and torment. Yeah, and that, the shouting. And the, you, was that the, easier for I you? I realised at a very young age, you can shout at me as loud as you want, but you're not going to make me pregnant and you're not going to lock me out by shouting at me. Right? So you can shout at me as anyone. Can, I always laugh sometimes. I've got this thing, I get told off, I almost laugh at you because I'm thinking, <laughs> come on, why are you yelling at me? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It just it's probably a little bit of nerves in there. Like, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I'm thinking, why are you doing that? Do you know what mm. I mean? Because shouting at me is never going to achieve anything. Do you know I mean, you can shout at me all you like. Um, push comes to shove, different matter, isn't it? But yeah, it was in those days, training was. And I'm not going to say it's harder than what it is now because I've seen the lads and lasses training now and they're still, you know, they're still leaving home. They're still, and it, kids are different now. So they've got phones and stuff and all that sort of stuff. We never had all that, do you know what I mean? So t totally different to compare then to now, but it was tough. You're away from home. The shouting and the screaming didn't bother me, but I love learning. See, the, and this is but this is what people ask me about SAS selection. Is it tough? Yeah, it's the toughest selection in the world. It's hard as nails, all right? But because I was learning, that like overbalances, overrides the toughness. Because I might be I might be hanging out, I might be hurting, I might be in pain, I might have no toenails left and my back's hurting and all that sort of stuff. But I'm learning and I'm doing cool stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is brilliant. Like, do you know what I mean? So yeah. And that's how I felt in basic training. You know, sometimes there was a couple of times when I probably thought, oh, I want to go home. But then you see through see through that, pick yourself up. Do you know what I mean? Is there air still going in my lungs? Yeah, I'm all right. Carry on, didn't you? Do you know what I mean? When did you thrive? When did you realise this is what I love? This is what I want to do? When did uh, it sink in? Probably. <laughs> I did all right in training. I got best improved recruit. But someone told me the other week that meant I was a wanker when I turned up and they got me over the line. Like, do you know what I mean? So I wasn't the best soldier then. Um, I think I got to my battalion. It took me a while to set in as a private soldier. There was guys there who'd done operational tours and all that sort of stuff, and I was like a bit sort of like clunky and what have you. And then we did a two-year tour of Londonderry, and I just took to it, loved it, couldn't get enough of it, out all the time. I volunteered, do you know what I mean? Anything going on, my hand would go straight up. I'll break your neck with me out. I'll do that, do you know what I mean? Loved it. And I just came to four there, and I came back from there, I think... I got my first stripe after that, and that went on and came off again and went on again, do you know what I mean? And then did my junior... Yeah, so, yeah, but going back to your question... Definitely, 100%, that tour of Northern Ireland was a wake-up call for me. It was There was real stuff going on, do you know what I mean? I was involved in a couple of incidents where I could have lost my life quite easily. It was real, it was happening, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I genuinely loved it, do you know what I mean? Obviously, with the Northern Ireland, it's mad to think the troubles that went on there. Yeah. But what was... Because I, who did I speak to? I spoke to someone, he says the British were there to help. The British soldiers were they there. Were, so, that or is that a origin, no, originally is when they story? turned up, they they, they as, so I read the history before I went because I don't believe you should go anywhere unless you know what you're on about. Like, do you know what I mean? So I, I read a little bit about it. And there's all sorts of history. It goes back to the potato famine in the South and all sorts of stuff going on, right? So, But bring us up the date a little bit. When the British Army first went in there, it was because the, the, the Catholic families felt they were sort of like almost pinned into their estates. And they went. The, the, the British Army went in as a buffer. And that, that was how it was. And there was sort of like, they call it the honeymoon period. There was a honeymoon period where, you know, the Catholic families were giving you cups of tea and all that sort of stuff. As it progressed and things escalated, it then became more that, you know, they were protecting these. And then as soon as it, it, it sort of like flipped itself on its head. But originally, yeah, the, the, the British army were there to look after the Catholic families. What was it like back then? It wasn't the busiest of times. I mean, we were talking about 80, 88, something like 88, 89. It wasn't the busiest of times. But you had to be careful. And I remember I remember reading this before I went, and it was something that either Jerry Adams or Martin McGuinness had said, you know, we've only got to be lucky once. You've got to be lucky all the time. And that lived with me out there because I thought, yeah, you're right. I've got to be lucky all the time. I've got to switch on. For the time I'm here, I've got to switch on unrelentingly. Do you know what I mean? There's no time when I can just sort of like... Do you know what I mean? Because that'll be the time it all goes pop and all goes bang. So, yeah. <laughs> so they actually done me a favour there. 
how has it been from basic training to then going into something where you can your life's at risk is it a big step or you knew you... it was coming you knew it was coming you knew you were going to go to Northern Ireland those days as did the the, the guys and girls that joined up that knew that they were going to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan subsequently you know it's going to happen you know, the lessons that you're learning in training aren't telling you that the enemy are going to tickle you. Do you know what I mean? They're going to try and kill you. So you know that. But once you step over into that environment and it's real, then you've got it. Then then everything you learn, you better have learned it well. Like, do you know what I mean? You've, you've got to bring that to that. And even if you've learned it well, sometimes you've run lucky. It's going to, you know, it can happen to anybody. But like I say, you've got it, that, that transition from going from training into things. And that's why, that's why I enjoyed the training so much, because it's intense. I'm learning something that actually, if I go and employ this, it's real. How was your anger then when you started doing the training and getting fit? Did it calm down or did you become more ruthless? Channeled, channeled. And, but I could turn it on. And boy, could I turn it on when I turned it on. Like, do you know what I mean? And I think, you know, in those early days, sometimes you did, it's, it's like a pressure cooker. Like, do you know what I mean? Sometimes you need to lift that little pfft, and then, and I'll go downtown and do that. Do you know what I mean? So I could, you know, I'll be king of the kebab shop now and again. You know what I mean? And I didn't. It, 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 I wasn't nasty, but if you know yourself, someone looks at you funny in a in a pub. You've got two choices, isn't it? You can you can look funny back and have a tear up, or you can sort of like ignore it and walk on. I ain't walking on when I was younger. I do now. Do you know what I mean? But when I was younger, it'd be a case of, oh really? Okay, yeah. Come on, then let's have that. Then do you know what I mean? And I was a bit like that. But that was, I think, that's. Tension, that's that's steam. That's that's you taking the little pfft and then a little bit off, like do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It wasn't nasty. I didn't go out thinking, right, I'm gonna smash someone's head in tonight. I don't go out, you know, looking for trouble. Mm -hmm. But if it was there, then pfft, all right, then we'll have a little bit of that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what did you do after Northern Ireland? Um, pretty much Northern Ireland again. Do you know what again? I mean? It was Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, until I did selection and then, you know, other things opened up, you know, went went across to Bosnia and stuff like that and um West Africa, and so little, little things, you know, once one, one, one like that. Again, because there was so much, it, it was only Northern Ireland when I was when I was in. So it, it was Northern Ireland, and to go anywhere else at the time, so I sat I sat in Northern Ireland through the first Gulf War, watching other soldiers going out of the war and thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I'm sat here. So to, that was one of the driving factors behind me wanting to go in the SAS, because I knew if you went in the SAS, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get yourself into some sort of position do you know what i mean where you're gonna where you're gonna see combat was that then the goal to then strive to then see combat and get that sort of yeah because adrenaline? i think for me it wasn't so much even about the adrenaline it was about doing the job i didn't feel that northern ireland had pushed me to my my extremes do you know what i mean yes i've worked extremely hard i've done some really good jobs over there you know I felt like I needed to go and do something that was going to absolutely push me as hard as I could ever go. And selection and being in the SAS was that for me. Do you know what I mean? That was, that was what I, that was what I, that's what I wanted to do. And I liken it in its simplest thing. If you was a butcher and you spent your whole life in a butcher's shop, but nobody ever let you cut a pig open, you'd be a pretty pissed off butcher, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? You'd be, a, you'd, be, you'd feel like you were just the butcher's mate, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? And I felt like that about soldiering. I thought if I don't get ever see combat. I'm just going to be, I'll still be a soldier, but I won't be the soldier that I wanted to be. I wanted to see combat. And I, that, that's what. What age did you go, SAS? Uh, 26, 27, something like that. So that's pretty late for some as well. It is that, yeah. Some, some guys go, I think, and my advice to people nowadays would be if you want to do that, go early. Because you get more time there, didn't you? Do you know what I mean? You're going to get more time there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Because I know I've spoken to people who's went 22, 23, but then again, late 20s now, I think everything's changed, hasn't it, Phil? Yeah, yeah don't, don't forget. So I didn't really, I didn't feel ready as a soldier until I'd done some other bits and pieces as well, you know, about promotion courses and all that sort of stuff. So I probably could have gone a little bit earlier. Whether I'd have been strong enough, I don't know. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But I didn't, so. What was, uh, were you nervous doing it? No, funnily enough, not. Is that, do you think, because you'd matured a bit? And not yeah, I think, you, I, you know, it was another course. You get there on day one and there's all sorts going on. Do you know what I mean? There's people looking at their maps, trying their boots on, doing this, doing that, doing the only like, gee, mm -hmm. there's hundreds of people there, like, do you know what I mean? And you're just one, you're just a number. You're a bed space. Do you know what I mean? And you just know every day, boom, just go out, do what you're told. I'll never look further than the next task. Never talk, try to think to myself, oh, I wonder what it's going to be like in the jungle when I was in the trees. Just took every day as it come. What am I doing? What am I doing next? Right, there you go. I've done that. Okay, what am I doing next? Do you know what I mean? And that's how I, that's how, because you could almost, I saw blokes doing it. 
oh, 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 next week we go, oh, <laughs> you haven't done today's work yet, you fucking idiot, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you're, you're shitting yourself about next week, you fucking twat. <laughs> uh, every Special Forces I've interviewed, SES, SBS, like, he's are tapped, he's not, there's something <laughs> not a miss, but well, it's all it as well, I think it's, it's, uh, there is something here, it's different. And I always say that because you know they are the bigger the, the cheese is saying the bigger they are the harder they fall and it's more the main, mental battle how pushes you through but everyone I've got nothing but respect for same as all Peter Macaulay's before they passed like just just a tough bastard yeah well, tough tough, tough man. Hard man hard man yeah hard yeah man. just tough yeah. like every man you come up and you think you can just see it that he's a tough bastards like he's just you get through life but the thing as well obviously everybody battles mental health and everybody fucking talks about that shit but. You seem to always put you guys push through it. Is that taught in selection, or is that already something that's wired that, before it's not, selection? It's not taught. I think they'll identify people whose mindsets are like that, and that's what they're looking for. You know, I've, I've never been the DS on selection. I've never been the one who picks people. But do you know what I mean? I know the people that I've served with, and yeah, there is probably something about everyone I've served with that's had that mindset. Mm. The mindset to keep going. The mindset to search for something when. Probably sometimes it isn't even there. Do you know what I mean? But they keep going. Mm -hmm. They keep no matter what it is, they just keep going. Do you know what I mean? And that's that is a mindset thing, isn't it? Because it's it is it's all too easy just to go, I'll step off a little bit here, do you know what I mean? Yeah. These guys that you know, the the, the, the men I served with didn't they, they don't step off, they keep going all the time. Because I went to the old folks home interview Peter and he's just laughing about his helicopter crashing and I think you're just fucking good on you, sir. Yeah. Just tough, man. I fucking yeah. love that. that yeah, they I will, thrive yeah. on that. Yeah. Like, I, I, I see, you know, I, somebody's I, a tough bastard, you know, yeah, you know, I'm not fucking with you. So, yeah. The SES guys, you have got that aura, that presence of, it's laughing, and listen, all laugh and joke, but you know, they can flip that something, man, where you know somebody's fucking going to get killed and it's, uh, there's, there's a serious side to it, but I think, yeah. Part of getting through some of that seriousness is the laughter. To have that sort of like attitude towards stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's, there's been a couple of times when things have been said that are probably out of context would be would be completely inappropriate. But at the time, it's quite funny. You know, <laughs> whatever. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm not going to repeat it here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it's. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. just sometimes think, yeah, there it is. Do you know what I mean? That, that's what it's about. No matter what level you're at mentally in life, laughter is the key. It's the Absolutely medicine is. to Absolutely anything. Is. It is. It, it, it's. It's hurt. It's. It's turned me round a number of times, you know. I, I make no bones of the fact that, you know, I've I've, I've had my troubles and my tribulations. I've, I've struggled with my with my mental health, but I, I think I've always managed to turn it around myself. I think now people are becoming more aware to it. In my day, they weren't. So I suffered, you know, towards the end of my time in the regiment, I was suffering inside. I was drinking far too much. I was becoming a menace downtown, overtly becoming a menace downtown, do you know what I mean? And... I think, you know, that got me nudged on a bit quicker. I got, you know, I got out under a bit of a cloud, having had an argument and smashed a few things up. And I think that was me struggling with my mental health. That was me. There was a couple of things went on that just I couldn't process in my mind. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And since then, you know, I've had to. I've had to deal with it. And that can be difficult. Yeah. No matter who you are, no matter yeah. what sort of training you've got, you got through in life. You've got to talk about it. I, I, had a, I, had a, I ended up remanded in custody in Winchester prison. Um, the original charge was, I think they tried to do with attempted murder and attempted GBH or something like that. Anyway, it was all out of proportion. Massive argument at home, put a window through, gobbed off at a few neighbours, had a roll around with the couples when they turned up. Before you know it, you were in front of the peak. <laughs> Go, didn't you? So I, was, I remember getting into, getting into Winchester prison and I'm like, oh, here I am. Like, you know what I mean? Day one in the cell. And I've caught my face in, they've got like these, metal mirror type things, do you know what I mean? And I was sort of having the butchers around me cell and I'm going to get out of here, like, do you know what I mean? And I caught my face and I went back. I went, you fucking idiot. I looked at myself and I went, you fucking idiot. Do you know what I mean? Because no matter, I mean, I didn't, no charges got brought to bear in the end, it all got dropped. But the fact was, I was in Winchester prison, you know, remanded in custody, you fucking idiot. And I had a word with myself. I briefed myself up in the mirror. I'm like, you know that Don Logan step <laughs> on sexy <laughs> beats? Go, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm doing that to myself in the mirror. I'm going, you fucking idiot. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm talking to myself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. One of the best things I've ever done. Because I acknowledged it myself. I took it on board. I owned it. And I thought, right, I'm going to sort this out. Mm -hmm. And once I got out of there, do you know what I mean? started peeling back the layers and got myself back on the road. Do you know what I mean? But it was, it was hard. But you've got to take ownership of this shit. 
Do See, when you went to prison because my dad, he was a bouncer back in Glasgow and he had a couple of SES boys coming down to Victoria's, but the Vic the nightclub got the heads up to say, look, there's a couple of SES boys coming down. Don't fuck with them. See, is that the same when you get into prison? Do people get the heads up, the screws that you're SES? Uh, they knew. They knew I was. Oh, God, funny. So I went into the I went into the library because you couldn't get it. It's 23 hours a day bang up. So I'm like, any excuse, can I go to the library? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can go to the library. We'll get you in an hour. So I go to the library, right? I'm out of my cell. I'm down the wing. I go to the library. <laughs> Have you got Born Fearless by Phil Campion? The woman goes, yeah, it's back here somewhere. She gets it out. I signed it. She goes, what are you doing writing in the book? I said, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but no, they, look, I had a sort of like, when I went in there, you get a little brief, don't you? And you speak to the, to the to whoever's in charge of the wing and all that sort of stuff. And they knew, they'd been told, you're ex-SAS, do you know what I mean? It was all like a, we're not going to get any monkey business out of you, are we? And all that sort of stuff. No, you're not going to get any grief out of me, of course you're not. Mm -hmm. Just want to get just want to get me head down and get out of here as soon as I can, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, there was no real treatment or anything like that. I would imagine that they, the, the police had asked, I think the police actually went as far as getting hold of the regiment to ask what my skill sets were, do you know what I mean? <laughs> He's a very dangerous man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've Citizen. Have you seen that? Well, movie? I did drop a uh, tongue in cheek when I was in um when they when they remanded me in custody. I was I was still half cut. I I had my boxer shorts on. They give me these white bloody overalls. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm in a dock and I got <laughs> I got me beach me me, me me brief is next to me and um <laughs> oh I, I got overheard. I'm not sure I got overheard by the magistrate. Because they said, the, the prosecution said he's the most dangerous man in Hampshire. And I turned around jokingly to my brief and went, who the fuck have they got in Dorset? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, see, when you've done selection, Phil, how many people how many people were doing it at that time? I don't know, probably about anywhere between 250 and 300. I don't really know. You turn there on day one, there's the, the, the accommodation's full. By the end of that first four or five weeks, it's half empty, like, do you know what I mean? So, Were you surprised at the people who fell off? Yeah, I was. Yeah, because you look at some of them and you think, Jesus, do you know what I mean? They're twitching like racehorses, you know? <laughs> do mm. you know what I mean? And you're going, wow, look at him. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they just, they, they go. And you're like, do you know what? And, and this, sounds, this sounds probably a little bit wrong as well. There's a little bit of this. You go like... See you later then. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because what man you yeah. want to win. I want every country feeling if I was there. Like that. Yeah. Oh, see I would want them all getting injured and failing and crying and breaking. That's a man thing. Yeah. But we do look people up. Do you do that though because of the damage you know you can do? Do you look up people and go, behave yourself? That, look, there used to be a time where every room I walked into you try and work out every. He's going, yeah, no, maybe. Just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm happy here, more. Right. <laughs> I don't bother none of this stuff yeah. anymore. Do you know what I mean? But when I was younger, you did. I think you do, don't you? Yeah. You yeah. You you wait, got, you wait, yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, if you if you if you if you're playing football, this is this is what. If you say you don't do this, if you're playing football and you're you're on the field kicking the ball about before the game starts, tell me if you don't look at the opposition and go, oh, well, you're good. Do you yeah. know what I mean? No, just see that. Yeah, you're just waiting up. Yeah, you just waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, that's how I think men. I think that's just ingrained in us. Yeah. To then we all want to be better than each other, no matter who you are yeah, or what. Yeah, we, we always want to be number one. But there is so when once you've got that level, there's also the team thing, isn't there? Do you know what I mean? So I do, you know, I understand the ethics of a team, and there's no iron team and all this sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? So I get that. But on selection, it's you trying to get into the regiment. That's it. Bust. Do you know what I mean? There's no, you're not, you are in a team for the jungle and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, but you have still got to perform all the time yourself. And part of that performance has to be team led as well. Do you know what I mean? But there's definitely 100% when you see me like that. See you later. Did you see, did you, did you, was there any doubt any time going through selection in your mind? Um, there was a couple of times where I thought I could quite easily go home here, but I wanted it so badly. I wanted it so badly. I, I just, there was no, there wasn't, that wasn't an option for me. All right. So there is an option called VW, voluntary withdrawal. That is an option. Wasn't my option. All right. You, 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 you're going to, you, you're going to, you're going to carry me out on a, on a stretcher or I'm going to pass. And that's it done. So if I physically can't go on anymore, and even then, do you know what I mean? I was told once by the doctor because I dislodged my retina on before the last March and he went, Oh, you're not going to be able to continue. I, went, I am. 
Do you know what I mean? And he went, no, you're not, I am. And I signed a little waiver and that to say that if there was any damage long-term in my eye, it was my fault. Like, do you know what I mean? So there, there, I wasn't, you know, everybody, I probably had a fracture on one of my toes. I had no toenails left. So there was plenty of excuses, incredible excuses. I've got no skin left on my back. All right, off you go then, see you later. Do you know what I mean? Right. No, that wasn't an option for me. If you have physically got to pick me up, take me to the ambulance and put me on it, then that's one way of getting me off selection. The other way is pass me or fail me. If you tell, if you tell me I fail, but I'm not walking out of this course. I'm not. I'm not going to say no, and I'm not going to say I can't do that anymore because that, that, that just wasn't an option. So if you rule that off, it's like writing your own rules for the course, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you write that into your in, from the beginning, you go, no, I'm, I'm passing this. I'm doing this, and those are my rules. My rule are number one: I'm never walking off this course. That's mm -hmm. it. Do you know what I mean? So the choice is <laughs> it's either in their hands or your hands now because they can fail you, or you know the big man upstairs can go. You've had enough of you. You can you can be injured like. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. that's it. That's the only choices. What was the worst thing about selection? <sighs> worst as in, worst as in repetitive to, to repetitive slog is probably the hills phase because it's every day. There's no, you just you're just proving you can walk up and down a hill with loads of weight on. Do you know what I mean? So there's no real, there's no soldiering to be had. Do a bit of navigation. So there are skills that you need to employ. Your real soldiering starts on selection in the jungle. So when you go to the jungle, that's when you are being looked at as a soldier. When you're walking up and down a hill, you're walking up and down a hill, aren't you? you know what I mean? The fact you can go for eight to be in four kilometres an hour or whatever they're going to ask you to do it in, you just got to prove that you can keep up with the pack when you get out there so that you're not slowing everybody down, basically. But you, you sold, So the hills phase is a slog. It's a proper slog. Uh -huh. it's, it's unrelenting every day, big green pack on, up and down the hills until they say stop. Do you know what I mean? So that's that. That's a bit of a slog, and it gets a lot of people. It gets a lot of people. A lot of people walk off of that. Are you encouraging each other? Yeah, yeah. You know, if I come across <clears> someone <throat> who's struggling, right, mate. But you know, I can't. I can't make you do it. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit. There is a little bit sort of like every man for himself on the hills face because it is. You are doing it for yourself at that stage. You know, you're not working in a team. You you're literally going from A to B until you can't go from A to B any longer. Or they say stop. So you know, or you or you walk off the course. Mm -hmm. so you've got to do it that's that that's the choices and i yeah no so that was a slog the hills phase was a slog but again in the back of my mind i'm thinking get through this gonna do some soldiering do you know what i mean get through this gonna go into the jungle let's go to the jungle the sas <laughs> come on what's not a love about that do you know what i mean <laughs> what's about you do you know what i mean <laughs> i'm going to the jungle with the sas how many nice people gun. how many people pass selection um i can't remember 10 or 15 past mine out of the three or 300 or so that Pat Cook turned up. How was that feeling for you? Again, very unceremonious. It was, we literally, I remember we went into the theatre. Um, we sat in the theatre, like the, day one, I think we'd been in the, we'd been in the theatre before we'd been to the jungle, you know, with what was left from the hills and it almost filled the theatre. You're now in the theatre, the front row's not even full, there's a few of you left. Like, I mean, the CO came in, basically said, You've all just about scraped through. You're a bunch of twats, and now you've got some real work to do. Off you go. And you're like, yeah, cheers for that, thanks. Yeah, there was no sort of like... Mm -hmm. None of that. Street you know what I mean? yeah. Everybody celebrating. No, it's yeah. all like, right. But going to get me kit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that, is that their job, to bring you back down straight away? I don't think... I don't... Yeah, not... I just think that's the way it is. I remember bumping into a mate of mine now. And he was, he'd, he'd, he'd been in the same unit as me before I went to the regiment. And I just happened as I come out, I was walking back to the block to literally get some more kit and go and sign for some kit. And then I was, I, I, I literally worked the day I got badge luck, do you know what I mean? And um, I remember going back and I, I walked past him and he goes, he goes, well done, Phil. And he goes, you'll probably see a few more funerals here than you've seen. And apart from that, welcome to the club. And I'm like, <laughs> cheers for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> really? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it, but there was that sort of like, it's not, a, it's not a come down, but you suddenly realise now the work begins. Mm -hmm. Selection is a course. Selection is, selection is, for want of a better word, you know, playing at it, learning the, the craft. Now, at any given time, you know, I got given a pager almost in the first week I was there. Now that can go bang and you're off. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you think to yourself, no, this is real. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, there's an element of that. See, before selection... To after selection, do you feel different as a man, something internally, or do you actually just feel the same? No, no, just I, I, I'd, I'd lie if I didn't feel like I'd puff my chest out a little bit more like that with the regiment. You know what I mean? You do get a little bit. I, I suppose I did feel like that a little bit, but it doesn't really, 
Because everybody else was in the regiment around you, weren't they? Do you know what I mean? So it's not like you're not like you're the only one who's ever done it, are you? Do you know what I mean? It's like you just you go you fit straight in. And I remember going to the going to the squadron's interest room for the first time to see to sort of like meet everybody. I'm like, wow. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, wow. Just almost in awe of two or three of them, right? Do you know what I mean? Thinking, wow, this is crazy. Do you know what I mean? I'm actually here. Yeah. But you can't sort of like, you don't want to show that, do you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to cut around like, you know what you're doing? Like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because the SAS, it was a secret kind of society back then. Was When did the SAS start? Oh, the 40s. So the, the, the yeah, end, but was, the was it war, not yeah. the the rescue mission in London that kind of heightened Right, so it? what put them on the map yeah. publicly was the Iranian embassy. Uh -huh. you, know, the, you know, and... Once people saw those men in black kits storming, that was the first time I saw the regiment. I was in the chip shop when that went off. I was like, wow, I've run over. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Yeah. everyone was, I can remember seeing it in the chippy. And I watched it to the point where they sort of like panned away from it because it had gone a bit quiet. And I run home. And by the time I got home, there was, it was on a replay. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like news flash, wasn't it? The old, mm -hmm. did, 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 the old news flash come up. <laughs> and there's yeah. people bouncing through roofs. And I'm like, wow, ridiculous. And I used to have, um, when I was one of the kids, home, I used to have a, I used to have this black bell staff jacket and it was a big bendy tree outside and I used to jump on the bendy tree pretending to be a sass man and then run in the thing with me little spud like that. Uh, <laughs> ain't it mad because I remember that. Who did I have on? Um, Rusty. Rusty. Rusty oh, the Rusty. Man gloves. Yeah. Yeah, he's a car. Oh, Rusty is fucking tough as fuck. One of the, one of the men, one of the, um, SES were stuck on the rope as well, or yeah, something outside. Fire, yeah, yeah, it was a pretty, it was a pretty, yeah. It, but so the story goes, and I wasn't there, and I'm not going to claim any glory from this story whatsoever. But the story goes that when the when the thing went in, when they decided they were actually going to go, and they were given the sort of like thumbs up, they were going to smoke it off. They were going to have a big smoke thing, bump, so we couldn't see him. Mm -hmm. like Margaret Thatcher apparently turned around and goes, "No, no, no, no! I want the whole world to see how we deal with these people." So she she wouldn't let them use the smoke. She said, "No, nah, I want." TV cameras. I want them there. I want them just. I want you lot being seen because we're not having this anymore. We went, and I thought that was quite. That was quite for the time. Was quite ballsy. I mean, yeah. we're not having that. But this is how we do with this sort of stuff, right? Have some of that, right? Watch. There you go. Off you go, lads. <laughs> do you know what I mean? From then to do that, the ballsy stuff. It's all changed. They wouldn't. We wouldn't be doing that now. They wouldn't show fuck all. I think. Do you think the UK is becoming weaker, Phil? I don't have weaker. So the battlefields become more dangerous in as far as. Drones, technology, night times now, day, you know, I can see you with thermal, I can see you with this, I can see you with that. So it's hard a place to hide now, the battlefield. So in that respect, you know, you've got to try and keep it away from people, haven't mm -hmm. you? Do you know what I mean? It, and it, the other thing is, everything now is filmed, isn't it? E absolutely is. Everything is filmed, mm -hmm. which makes it difficult again, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Do you, how do you think the UK is in a whole, the Britain? How do you think Good best it stands? Good yeah, I believe so. I'm not being biased. Like the SAS and uh, is unbelievable. But um, how do you feel? Do you think we could be a target to get invaded at any point? Or as we, I get, think I, the world would have to go completely bonkers, barking before that happens. I don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon. No. China, Russia. Yeah, no, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I don't think there's anything to worry about on that front. Do you know what I mean? I think there's there's years worth of stupidity all over those borders before it comes this way. Like, mm. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, it, 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 all sorts of posturing and all that sort of stuff and saber rattling and how many times have they been out of their box? But you know, yeah, I don't see it. I, I don't see it happening here. I think we're more likely to see more in internal terrorism. Is what I think we're more likely to see here. I think you know, we're not we're not over things going to pop in town yet. I don't think that's that's you know the security services. I wouldn't mind betting they're working around the clock to keep the lid on things in that respect. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, well, like I guess the world can be a good place, but if you've never really seen it firsthand the way you've seen it, it's hard to judge because everybody, I'm oblivious to it. I've never been in battle, so it's understandable for people who, who've lived that life to understand what actually goes on. Do you see the world differently from everybody else's eyes who are kind of not, um, not, not naive, but kind of oblivious to what goes on, actually? I I see a world in which in order in order for peace, sometimes you need to have war. Do you know what I mean? You certainly need to have people who are ready for war. You know, we're in the, what, what, what was it said the other week by one of these commanders said, we're, we're pre-war at the moment. We are before a war. We're not at the end of the war. We're not in peace. We are pre-war because there's a war coming. There's, something will happen. In the, you know, you look, at, you look at the history over the last, 
you know, even since the 40s, every sort of like 10 years, whether it be the Suez, whether it be Borneo, whether it be Northern Ireland, whether it be Bosnia, every 10 years there's something in that cycle, mm -hmm. isn't there? Do you know what I mean? Something where British troops are getting involved. And that's just the way of the way of the world, unfortunately. Do you know what I mean? Because people want to have it their way and other people want to stop them having it yeah. their way. And that's that's how it works, isn't it? Greed as well comes into play with a Greed lot of comes these factors. In, you know, I'm sure that, you know, there's a bigger picture behind a load of stuff. Do you know what I mean? Oil and gas and strategic yeah, gold, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, stuff all that sort of stuff probably comes into play on the on the mm -hmm. bigger picture. I've never seen that bigger picture, really. I've only ever seen it from the point of view of a soldier who gets sold, right? You've got to go and sort that out. Off you go. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? So, yeah, I don't really, I don't even profess to understand the bigger picture, to be honest. But, you know, when I look at the world, I see a world that is massively troubled. And it, those troubles ain't going away because people are so far polarised from each other. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's a shame because, you know, we are, for all intents and purposes, the only beings in this known universe, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? And we can fuck it up. <laughs> we are fucking you know up. I mean? We can fuck it up. You're like, wow. It's fucking crazy, that. You know what I mean? We are, for all intents and purposes, for as far as we can see, and we can see a pretty long way out, yeah. we are the only things that even have a pulse. It is crazy to think the destruction that goes on in the yeah. world. But like you say, sometimes there needs to be violence. Um, but do you think sometimes when you, you say you don't look at the bigger picture, that's because it makes it easier to then have... Don't it probably makes time. it easier to process. You you could you could scare yourself if you start going right into stuff. Yeah, and then the conspiracy theories. <laughs> I'll, I'll put me tin foil hat on. I'll be like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm at it. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't I don't really go. I do, do you know what? I don't. Even, I haven't got time for that shit either. Do you know what I mean? I've got yeah. I've got my own things. I've got my grandchildren to bounce about. I've got my dog to walk. Yeah. I ain't got time to be picking that shit apart. I want to walk my dog. Do you know yeah. what I mean? What dog you got? I've got a little Scottish terrier. Scottish yeah. terrier. Andrew's name yeah. is <laughs> Scottish name as well. Is yeah. Uh, yeah, that is mad though. When you you can go around the bend like my great grandparents, they all fought World War Two, and I fucking loved the war stories when I was a kid. Mm. Loved them to bits, and yeah. and a beautiful world. Everything would be peaceful and everybody could skip down the road and laugh and joke. Yeah. It's just not the fucking that, that, case. That picture is a nice picture, but it's just, it, it's unrealistic. It's not reality, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's never going I to happen in our lifetime. You know, and it's, it's the 80th anniversary of D-Day this week, right? Mm. And I do sometimes wonder that some of those young men on the beaches, I wonder what they would have made of today. If, you, if you could bring them back and you could go, right, this is what you saved, this is what this is what I said. And they'd have to look around town and go, Jesus Christ. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think I'll go, I think I'll skip this one. I'll go to the pub instead. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> yeah, it does, man. It, and like I say, there's so many people who lost their life and loved ones through trying to do the right thing. And like you say, you were a soul judge just for them. a village or a town where somebody, you, everybody knew somebody who was affected by it. Everybody knew somebody. Every village. If you walk around any village in this town, there'll be a cross. There'll be somewhere where people can lay poppies and all that sort of stuff. Every and that's how big it was. It was huge. It was, everybody was involved. And I think nowadays, you know, there's a tendency that you know, it doesn't get talked about in schools enough. We are only here by the grace of those people that gave their lives on that beach. That's the only reason we're here. Do you know what I mean? They are. They and they. You know, they saved people that they didn't even know. Do you know what I mean? And I think it would be an absolute travesty to forget about that. It needs to be spoken about. It needs to be talked about. And it needs to be understood. Yeah, back then, people were lying about their age to go and fight in wars. Yeah. Now people are fucking going suicidal because they're not getting enough caviar for dinner. Look, like people, it's flipped. It's like, As I said, soft in generation for my eyes. I was raised in a rough area. I'm glad I was at the back end where it wasn't technology. Yeah. Um, even when, like I say, my grandparents used to talk about when gr growing up in Glasgow, Clyde Bank and the planes coming over, they had to switch off all the lights. Their, their husbands yeah, were away fighting. Yeah, and, sort of stuff. and, yeah, uh, and you, you don't really think, because I've never seen it, I've never seen it no. in my generation, but when they talk about shutting the curtains and bombs were getting dropped at Clyde Bank and you're thinking, fuck me, like how tough they come through that. And they lived to 80s, 90s and just, just tough old bastards, man, but things change what was the first thing you done after SES what was the first um, well so I literally got out on the 1st of September 2001 and on the 9th then two planes went bink into the into the towers in America and I knew there was going to be loads of work on so I was like wow um, I'd PVR'd so I don't think I could join back up again so I almost manoeuvred myself into a position where I went almost straight to Afghanistan and started earning money so I went on that private military circuit and started earning dough from day one I was like wow this is insane do you know what I mean and it, it just 
it just snowballed from there. I went, I spent nearly three years in Afghanistan. Then I went to Iraq for a couple of years. All sorts of stuff was opening up for me then. Do you know what I mean? And it was all, it was all good money. It was, it was ridiculous. It was like, you know, I tripled my wages overnight and it was like, you know, money isn't everything, but then, I, then I, that's when I sort of like really opened my eyes to, to other stuff drinking and going on the piss and I'd never been able to afford to do that massively I'd always been a, a drinker do you know what I mean I'd always been going out when I could but now I was coming home and leaving I had thousands of pounds on the bank I'm like you know what I mean? mm. it was crazy crazy times crazy times and, and the work was insane so you know sometimes sometimes you just you shouldn't have even been where you were do you know what I mean you, I went across, when I first went across the, the border into Iraq no one knew I was in there do you know what I mean? I didn't stamp my passport. Nothing. I literally drove in there and went and hid on some camp. It was insane. Do you know what I mean? It, it was mad. So the risks, although the risk, although the work wasn't what I would have really have liked to have been doing, which was kicking down doors with the rest of them, right? Do you know what I mean? It was still insane. There was still some mad risks being taken, and it was like what? Oh, just 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 to drive across the country sometimes. You know what I mean? We were I remember going from going across Afghanistan and we drove all the way up north, went through the Panjshir Valley and all through the all through the hills and the mountains. There's all sorts of going up there, do you know what I mean? You had to, you had to, you had to be, you had to know what you're doing, like, do you know what I mean? And it was great. It was a buzz. It was, you know, and you were getting paid for that as well, do you know what I mean? So, Did you become an alcoholic, Phil? No, but I did do it too much. Was I don't it, think I was an alcoholic. The <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but so the difference is when I went back to work, no, no drinking mm -hmm. whatsoever, completely switch it off. So you don't have the day just no, sneak well, yeah, a drink? Yeah, so I didn't need a drink, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, when I came home, I'm like, you know, you do, you, you Catch me with a bottle of Moe in one hand and a short in the other. Like, do you know what I mean? I'll be, I'll be going nuts. Do you know what I mean? But, but I could turn it off as quick as I turned it on. So it never became a problem where I thought, oh, I've got to have a drink, I've got to have a drink, I've got to have a drink. Do you know what I mean? It was always, it was always controllable from that respect. The drink was always controllable. I wasn't. I became a bit of a menace. On the drink or off the drink, both? Um, not off the drink. I was all right off the drink, but it was on the drink. I just, I'm, I'm just a menace on it. Do you know what I mean? Just a menace. Just drinking mm -hmm. too much. Far too larry, far too loud. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's not it's not a good look, is it? I'm you know surprised I mean? at that, though, with that. Usually when people who have got that experience of combat and tough and ready to go any time, usually it suppresses it. Um, I always speak about it. In the <coughs> grip house in Glasgow, I used to do Muay Thai. Yeah. And the kids who'd done it, you would never think they were fighters. But it was guys like me who'd get do a few fucking weeks on the pads and all of a sudden I think I'm a world-class fighter <laughs> and I'm the loudest man in the pub. But it's yeah. these kids who are skateboarders and just keep themselves to themselves. Yeah. Like you kind of went the other way because you already had that anger and yeah. fucking madness in you. Was that hard to think, was that hard to suppress? Was that hard to really I work think boxing, through? Boxing suppressed it for me. And I, I got to the stage where I just knew I had to do something that that, that satisfied what I, I had a need for a achievement, somewhere to put your aggression. Do you know what I mean? And boxing did all that for me. Because once I started boxing, and I was really lucky, I came into town here, I boxed out of the Peacock. Great people in the Peacock, you know, East London's finest club, I think, do you know what I mean? Lovely people. You could always go in there and have a and, a, and have a tear up at any level you wanted, do you know what I mean? If you want it hard, someone will give it hard. If you want it soft, you'll get it soft, do you know what I mean? People looked after and I learned so much about the sport. And that actually, that really, that that did suppress me. Boxing suppressed all that sort of stuff. I wasn't going out drinking because I, I you don't want to get, I want to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to the gym and hit a bag and have a move around with people. You don't do that if you're drinking, do you? Mm -hmm. You roll about and you scratch at all midday, didn't you? Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. boxing really, really put me in a great mindset with people who wanted to achieve, who wanted to get fit, who wanted to do this, wanted to do it. And like I say, we, I put on fights. I put on great fights in the York Hall. Do you know what I mean? I filled the York Hall. With, with SAS soldiers fighting US soldiers. Do you know what I mean? Who won? Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll we, we give them a good old... we give them a good <laughs> go. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But it, it, was to, it was to showcase the mentality of the man, that he was prepared to jump in the ring and have a fight to help other people. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That was what I wanted to showcase, and that's what we did, and we raised a load of money doing it. Do you know what I mean? And the boxing really put me back on the map, and I'll, st I'll still do it now. Do you know what I mean? I still, I still box now. Were you ever satisfied, Phil? No. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's one of the regimental ethos is, is an unrelenting pursuit of excellence, and it's not always excellence with me. But I'm, 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 I've, I've always got to be going for something. I've always got to be, I've always got to be pushing ahead. I've always got to be. I'm looking for the next thing to do every time. My missus says to me, "Yes, it's still there." Like, no, I don't sit still. No one sits still. <laughs> you know, when I finish my time on this planet, I'm gonna sit still for God knows how long. Do you know what I mean? So who knows? But while ever I'm here, I'll just keep going for stuff. Like, do you know what I mean? What was the worst thing you ever seen when you were on tour? 
Um, it's a funny one. This, so I think for me personally, it was a, it was a. Well, I got asked this the other week. And I didn't really answer it because I didn't. I can answer it. I am going to answer it. Yeah, the worst thing I ever saw was in Syria when I was making a documentary for Sky News, and there was a woman there who had learning difficulties who'd been shot twice in the head by ISIS and raped. And I sat there talking to her through an interpreter as she just fucking bawled and blubbed. And I was like, fucking hell, what you haven't seen. Raped by ISIS, shot twice in the head. And she wanted to talk to us. She wanted to try and get, she knew we were getting the story out there. And I was, I was, I was fucking, it, it, pulled me, it pulled me all over the fucking place. And I didn't, actually, I didn't actually see the trauma. I could obviously see the scars on her head and what have you, but her story and hearing it, even through an interpreter, absolutely put anything I've ever done into fucking perspective. Do you know what I mean? Senselessly, she was kicked up and down the fucking road and raped whilst being fucking shot. Horrendous. Horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. How did she survive that? Her eyes were, her eyes were fucking vacant. Do you know what I mean? I was like, wow. And she sort of like, she talked and she welled up and she sort of like stared straight through you and all that. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was horrendous. Do you think it's harder to hear those stories than it is actually to kill someone? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Look, this is another thing that people, you, you say kill someone and I don't want to kill someone. Nobody's asking you to kill someone who doesn't deserve to die. Do you know what I mean? These people are going to fight you. You know, whether whether it be in, a, in, a, in an African village against against maniacs, whether it be in a, in a desert against you know whoever's troops or you know in a trench in Ukraine, somebody is trying to kill me. I'm going to try and kill you. That's the rules of the jungle, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So in that respect, it's not it's not difficult at all because those are the decisions mm -hmm. you've got to make on the top. But when you see someone who should never have been in that sort of situation, who didn't ask or want or and it just shouldn't have been there. You know, that woman should not have been anywhere near combat. She had Down syndrome. She was, she, she had a tough enough life as it was, you know, living in Syria with, 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 with something mentally wrong with her and to be kicked up and down and raped and horrendous. That's horrendous. That's not, that's nothing like shooting a bad, I'd shoot any one of those blokes who did that to her. Not a problem. Do it right now. Do you know what I mean? Wouldn't even raise my heart, Rev. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's fair game. It's like boxers signing up. If somebody gets hurt, you've signed up for it. Yeah, you yeah. Yeah, you signed up for it. I don't want to get punched in the head. Yeah, yeah there you go. Boxing's not yeah. for you, is it? No. What is it like? What was that story? You you killed someone by driving over them. Was that uh, was that your story? Yeah, no, it was. Uh, it was in Afghanistan, and somebody tried to ram the side of the car that I was in. I was in a push bike, and I was just running over. Just, yeah, just yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it As was, you do. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was, it, it was. It was perfectly justified. You didn't know in them days it could have been a suicide bomber. It could have been anybody. The the, the, the roads were cordoned off, so they they knew perfectly well. Don't go near anyone who's on the road, and they mm -hmm. come bundling through. It wasn't an accident. Don't know what he was up to, but yeah, because yeah, interviewed a, a sniper, and he's seen the woman and kid coming towards them. Yeah, he's just doing his job, man. And again, it's you don't know what they've got. Um, killed both. The woman did have the suicide vest on, but that call to make that call, it was, is it just a case of doing your job? And done? There is a there's a there's a thing which some people will probably say, you know, it's better to be it's better to be judged by twelve than carried by six. You know what I mean? And if a push becomes a shove, and if you're in that situation where you know, you know, it, this wasn't in central London at rush hour. Do you know what I mean? This was in Afghanistan in a, in a time when it it was quite heated in a convoy with people that they don't like. Do you know what I mean? Look at the clues. Do you know what I mean? So you, your decision's based on that, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? London, rush hour, tea time, just angry because I can't get home. I'm not going to run you over. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a different thing, isn't I it? I don't so, know, Phil, mate. You've got... You're as if you would enjoy it, if I'm honest. <laughs> it, put, it puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Do you know what yeah. I mean? So the you know, decisions you make out there are based around what, what what's going on out there and what you know. Do you know what I mean? What's so, the steps when you kill someone? Do you have to go through a certain procedure to, like a not like a court case, but to under, to say why you done it and what happened? Um, from experience, if you'd have been in Northern Ireland, and don't forget you were there as sort of like a policing role, really, it wasn't really a combat role. It was, you know, if you'd have if you'd have been ended up shooting someone in Northern Ireland, then yes, you probably would have reported it straight away. You know, you, 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 there would have been a right old turnout, there would have been forensics there and all sorts of stuff, do you know what I mean? If you were 
in Sierra Leone, say, for instance, on a hostage rescue mission, you know, none of that applies. You get back, you tell your stories, it's done, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? That's, that's what happened. You were out there, you came home. Do you know what I mean? So there was no, you know, we didn't stop to sort of like start fleshing things out and all that sort of stuff. It wasn't done. Do you know what I mean? I don't, <laughs> I don't expect to knock on my door for that one. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> do you know? So, yeah. It, it all depends where you are, what the rules are. You know, that all soldiers will be governed by rules of engagement, whether whether they briefed it or not. It, there'll be a there'll be some sort of governing body, whether it be the Geneva Convention or it'll be a card given to you that, as in Northern Ireland, you have a yellow card, didn't you? Which told you quite clearly, you can, you can't, you can, you can't. Yes, no, yes, no. Where's the most hostile place you've been, Phil? Gaza. Was that? Yeah, yeah, the renders, and not because. Still a lot of shit going down now. Yeah, yeah, it's horrendous. But not be because you couldn't get out of there. Once you were in, you were in. So we got, you know, we got we got attacked in Gaza and we managed to escape the people that were attacking us. We couldn't, in the, couldn't escape Gaza. We had to go and hide. You know, we ended up hiding in a, in a safe house type place. Yeah, horrendous place. Horrendous. Because, like I say, you couldn't escape. You couldn't, you couldn't even run to the wall. Because if you run at that wall, you're going to get shot by the Israelis. Like, do you know what I mean? So you, there was nowhere to hide in Gaza when we was in there. I mean, we got we got attacked a couple of times in there. It was like, wow, this is insane. Why were you there? Um, I went. I originally went over as part of the UN, and we were training a border force. And they were, you know, they were they, we were trying to use Palestinians to open the border so that they could get the the, the fruit and vegetables and stuff into the country and out of the country because the, the Israelis didn't trust anything coming and going, so they wanted them brought up to international standards. So, but then Hamas took over, and they executed all these guys that we trained and everybody. They they, they actually sent us they sent us a video with the guys that we trained and they killed them, put it to music like do you know what I mean? Yeah, cheers for that. <laughs> Ridiculous. And so. That was pretty much my time over in Gaza. And then all of a sudden, the, the Israelis, in retaliation for what Hamas had been doing, bombed a power station in a place called Deir al-Bala. And uh, there were some Swedish engineers, and they were the only people in the world that could fix this thing. Nobody else, the, the Gazans couldn't do it, the Israelis couldn't do it. And these Swedish engineers go, well, we're not going in there unless we've got people going with us. The only people that had the accreditation to get back in the country at the time was the team that I'd been on. So we went back in, and that was... That was dangerous because Hamas knew who we were and they knew we'd been training the other side. And so we made sort of like a, we made a cock and ball story up at the end and disappeared out to get some kit and never came back and told them, right, switch it on when we're gone, like, do you know what I mean? And that was it, we got out, but yeah, yeah, that was bonkers. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place. What do you think the outcome will be with Palestine and Israel? I don't know, I don't know. I, don't, I think that it's, it's, it's such a complicated thing. It really is so complicated. It breaks me. It does break me because you got, extremities on both who are fueling this thing hiding behind normal people normal people Gazans don't want that shit you don't think they want that shit of course they don't want that you know what I mean the average Israeli doesn't want that do you know what I mean so there's so many normal people ensnared in this thing that just this, there just doesn't seem to be a solution to it I don't know what the solution is and to understand anything politically around that part you've got to have a brain like a small planet you've got no chance of it do you know what I mean so yeah, it's just, it, it, it breaks me to see. I don't like to see innocent people suffering, and innocent people are suffering again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You can see that the media can portray the world the way they want to. The media they do, and the media part. don't help with some of this stuff no. either because they blow up one side or the other, and it's biased in this way. And they say they're not biased, and it, it, it all comes across. It, 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 yeah. I don't know. It's just. It's all messy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the media don't help any of this stuff. Were you a mercenary as well, Phil? Not in the sense. I was going over into these countries to topple governments or anything like that, but I suppose you could you could argue that you know I picked up arms for other countries. So in that respect, I was a mercenary. But yeah, I don't, I don't class myself as a mercenary. I just earned a few quid in and out. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you do it all for? About fifteen years. So when I got out of the regiment, for about fifteen years, I was in and out, and I ended up doing the anti-piracy stuff in the Gulf of Aden and all that sort of stuff. So. And that again, I mean, if I spent five years at sea, I probably spent five minutes with pirates. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot of time sat there with me top off getting brown. So you done the pirates and stuff? What yeah. happened? Not a lot. I was saying, I'm on my first ever trip. Mate of mine says to me, he goes, uh, he goes, Phil, 
He goes, do you fancy doing some anti-piracy? I'm like, I, I had no idea of none of this stuff. I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm expecting fucking bloke with a wooden leg and a fucking eye patch with a parrot on his shoulder. Like, I mean, what are all like fucking pirates? He says, no, Somalia. He says, it's all going off like Chinese New Year. He says, I keep nicking ships. I said, I'll have some of that. So he flew me down to, he flew me down to Muscat to get on a ship. And I said to him, how's it work? He says, oh, don't worry about it. He says, just make it up as you go along. He says, I'm going to give you a load of gear when you get there. He said, you'll have wire, you'll have all this stuff. So I've turned over Muscat and <laughs> gets up, gets down to get the agents pick me up and take me down to the ship. There's the, sh the shipping agents, normal people. I says, where's me barbed wire then? He goes, barbed wire? Barbed wire, Mr. Field, there's no barbed wire here. I said, no, I need some barbed wire. I said, I'm going, yeah, the pirate's going to try and get me ship. I said, I'm going to try and protect it. Like, no, there's no barbed wire. So I phones up this geezer back in the UK. I goes, Mac, I goes, there's no fucking barbed wire. I goes, where's the barbed wire? It's the exact words. I swear to this day, I can hear it now. He goes, nobody said it was going to be easy, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you twat. <laughs> then we got on this ship. And then, in them days, you weren't allowed to be armed. You couldn't have a gun or nothing like that. I mean, so we're get, literally getting on the ship. First port call, we're going to see the bosun. Right, bosun, what have you got in your store? Oh, we've got a load of this, a load of that, a load of the other. That, that was it. It was up being in the A-team. Do, 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 do. You're hanging barrels off the side and that. <laughs> Why no guns? It's got just the international shipping regulations didn't allow it. You couldn't... You, you, I mean, look at the, the, the shit those geezers got in and went to India that time. And they, they, they had guns on board. And they, they, they got done, didn't they? Do you know what I mean? So you couldn't go to half these places. And when you had an oil tanker... It could reroute halfway through the job. So you might be going down taking this oil to here. Somebody offers a bit more money for it. Oh, you're going over there now. Do you know what I mean? So you couldn't guarantee where you were going to be. So you couldn't put guns on it because mm -hmm. you could tip up somewhere and then you're, you're all in the shit, isn't you? Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it was, it was really difficult. Why did you decide to leave there, CS? Um, it, the decision was made for me a little bit, to be honest. I got in a bit of trouble. Um, and I PVR'd. I, I, I put my paperwork in the PVR, but in truth, I'd have probably got thrown out. Because I was, I'd come right off the rails. I'd come off the rails a little bit, yeah. I, I was drinking too much. I was being a twat. Um, I, I did have a few issues. And I, do you know what? This is this is the thing with mental health now, and I'm so glad people are talking about it now. Because I didn't feel like I still feel uncomfortable about it now, talking about it. Because in my own mind, I'm saying to myself, people are just going to go, yeah, fucking mental health, you wanker. You, you just, but there, there was a bit of mental health going on with me. Do you know what I mean? There was a bit of mental health for me. I, I wasn't acting like I should have been acting. And it, 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 it amplified itself with a drink. When did it come ahead? Um I've been I've been to a I've been to a night out, I've got pissed, I've been to some bar, and I picked on some fella. He'd said something to me, I'd said something back. But where I was so pissed, he'd give me a good fucking eye. <laughs> he'd give me a good slap, and I'm like, fucking hell. So I'm going home. Got home, and the missus said something, and I put a window through. And then the police came and I'd have rolled around with them. And then I sort of like, I went back into camp and it was obvious that they'd had enough of it. It was like, nah, this has gone too far. Like, do you know what I mean? And I was like, fuck. So I just, first opportunity, I just, I just spoke to my sergeant major and I was just said, I'll just PVR then. I just, I don't, I don't want to stay in the fucking army if I'm not here. This is the only place I want to be. So I'm going to get out. And I did. And I, and I PVR'd. And I, I, it was, you know, I, I, <laughs> I should have been able to play the mental health card. I should have been able, and it wasn't even a mental health card. I had fucking problems. I had severe problems. I, I couldn't come to terms with the death of a mate of mine. And he wasn't killed in combat. He was killed in a car crash. And that's why I couldn't come to terms with it. I could come to terms with combat death. I did, you know, it was, it, it, it was, it was one of those things you, you, but when he was killed senselessly in a fucking car crash, I fucking struggled. It fucking hurt me. It did. It really did. He was my best mate. And it fucking hurt me. It hurt me for a long time. It still hurts me now. And it did hurt me. And I just, I couldn't cope. I, and I had nowhere to fucking cope. And you couldn't, you couldn't talk to anybody about it. You didn't, you didn't feel like you could say anything because I'm going to be honest, right? I'm going to be honest. We come back from a, from a certain job and it was a job where it, it had been a kinetic. There'd been, there'd been some death. There'd been a bit of fucking blood and guts. And I remember the start major at the time turned around and sort of like tongue in cheek said, anybody got a problem with what we just did? Go and see the, go and see, go, go and see the doctor if you have. And it's almost said taking the piss. So I didn't feel at the time that I could say anything about my mental health. And that's a fucking horrible place to be because then what you do is it's like fucking taking a mento, putting it in the Coke bottle and putting the lid back on it and going, oh, you fizz about in there, you bastard. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. when that fucking lid comes off, it's coming off. Mm -hmm. It's coming off properly. Do you know what I mean? And I just felt I couldn't talk. And so I fell on my fucking sword. And, I, and the truth is they would have pushed me out anyway because, like I said, I got to the stage where I got in too much trouble. But there was a fucking reason behind that. Do you know what I mean? There was a fucking reason, and that, that 
I feel uncomfortable talking about it because I still in my own mind think that people are going to go, are oh, you just fucking saying that? You're twi- just trying to make excuses for being a cunt. Do you know what I mean? I didn't mean to see a C word. Yeah, show you. you say what the fuck you want, but brother. That's how I felt. That's how I felt that I couldn't say nothing. And I, this is probably the first time I've spoken about that. I know, but outwardly. All the shit that you've been through, the, the battered from your stepdad, fucking groomed from a per- fucking nonce, um, yeah. all the shit that you've seen. Do you think your mind as well? Do you think it was easier for you being in battle because it was like playing a different character where it's more accepted to see pain and misery? Because no matter if you're in real life, it's all real life, but you could separate both by being full of hate and rage and a war zone because it was normal even though losing your friend in a car crash, it's still all the same, but in your mind, you've separated them both. I can I can control, to a certain extent, the battle stuff. I can control the soldiering stuff. Do you know what I mean? It is Because you're following orders. Yeah. I couldn't control what happened to my mate, and that's really... If I, could, I say it, fucking, it destroyed me. He's such a fucking good bloke. Do you know what I mean? I was just... It was just... It was senseless. It was senseless what happened. I was fucking gutted about it. Yeah, and it just, like I say, it manifested in me. I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody, and I just... I remember the night we got told we were over in Norway and I went out and I drank for about fucking, I drank for about fucking 16 hours. And like I say, drinking does not help. If you think drinking is going to help your mental health, fuck off, because it ain't. It's going to fucking make it worse. Do you it think really that is. was the catalyst then? Do you think, but all the shit that you've been through, do you think that was just the kind of thing, you saying, putting the... That was the lid coming off That was, the lid, coming off, that the was the lid coming off then. And it was a product of me not... It was, you know, thinking about it even further back than that, it was probably a product of me never being able to tell anybody anything because when the fucking nonce got hold of us in fucking, in the, in the kids' home, he told me under no circum, fucking circumstances, you are the fucking cunt here, you are the bad boy, you're the one who, who's here because you're a fucking menace. So no one's ever going to listen to you, I'll do what I fucking want. You can't say anything, even if you say what's going on, no one's going to believe you, you're a little twat. That's what I was told, do you know what I mean? When I was a kid... I couldn't say nothing to my parents. They didn't fucking listen. They weren't interested in what I had to fucking say. I looked like fucking backhanded, like, do you know what I mean? So there was that sort of stuff going on in me. I didn't feel like I could fucking speak. I didn't know how to speak to anybody. I've never known how to speak to anybody. I'm only just getting used to it now. I speak, you know, Wendy, the girl I'm with now, you know, I love her to fucking death. I love her with every fucking inch of my body, right? She's probably the only person I've ever spoken to properly. And because I didn't, I, I could never speak to anybody. I just felt like I couldn't. I felt like I was making an excuse up or I felt like it wasn't a fucking excuse. It was what was fucking happening in my mind. Do you know what I mean? It was difficult. What was it like speaking to Wendy for the first time? Hard. I spoke to Wendy. I did an after dinner. I did an after dinner up in, um, where were we? Birmingham somewhere. And it was to a load of people that were in foster homes and stuff like that. And they were, they were managers and, and I fucking got into this fucking thing. And the bloke in front of me was talking about, nonces and people being interfered with in children's homes in the, in the, in the care system and he was going, he said something that along the lines that if people who'd been nonced spoke about it it might be easier for other people to identify what had gone on and so therefore put a, put a stop to it right i'm supposed to be going up next to do a talk to say how great my time in care was and how i turned out really well and i was now on telly and all this fucking shit and I thought to myself, you're fucking right, son. I need to fucking say something here. So there's about 300 people in this room. I went to the front of the fucking room. I had a speech ready. I went, right, not doing that. I went, right, I came in here to talk about this. I said, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to tell you how I was fucking nonsense in the children's home. Everyone's like that. Ah, and I'd never spoken a fucking word to anybody about this in my life. Nobody. I want to fucking let it go. Come out of this fucking thing. <laughs> you could have heard a pen drop as the moon walked out back as I do. Mic dropped on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe like, fuck here now. Got in my car, got Wendy on speakerphone, stuck the fucking thing in its fucking eye, in it in its pod, and I said, Wendy, you know, you know what I've just done. She goes, What? I guess I just told everybody something I've never told anybody. I've not even told you. I told her the whole fucking lot as I was driving home, fucking crying my eyes out. Crying my fucking eyes out like a baby in the car. And it was from then I realised, and I must have been fucking, how old was I? I must have been 45, 46, maybe in 47. I can't remember how old I was. And I just, for the first time in my life, I thought, fuck it, I'm going to fucking say what happened to me. Why shouldn't I say what fucking happened to me? Do you know what I mean? And so that's why I'm so mad for other people to fucking talk. Say what it is that's on your fucking mind. Because if you don't, that fucking Mento's in that bottle. And when that lid comes off, fucking hell, you fucking you stand back. It's mm-hmm. going to be a show. Do you know what I mean?
How how's it been the last few years for you, Phil? Now right. that you're starting to speak out and great, great. I've I've I think I think I've found myself. I take great fucking pleasure now in helping other people. You know, I'm an ambassador. I was an ambassador for the Army Cadets. I'm an ambassador for the military preparation training colleges. I take great pride in 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 helping young people. I take pr great pride in in talking about mental health. I take great pride in now the messages I get from random people who say to me, Phil, you've helped me. Do you know what I mean? That's worth more to me than anything. It's worth more than any anything you could do. Do you know what I mean? Why do you think we struggle to speak? Because sometimes you don't know where to go. And if you're not shown, you don't... I didn't know. I didn't, I, as a kid, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know. I, I was like, fuck, what do I do? Do you know what I mean? I don't want to. I'll keep my fucking mouth shut. I'll keep it in. Nah, big fucking mistake. Do you know what I mean? And that's I say. The first time I really spoke to myself, I spoke in the mirror. Too fucking late. I was already in fucking choky. Do you know what I mean? But then... Oh. Like I say, I realised I needed to talk to people, and then I started talking. And like I say, once I had that, once I had that moment, that epiphany, at the old uh, at, at the talk, that was it. Then couldn't shut me up. <laughs> when are you at your happiest, Phil? Um, when I'm with my missus and kids and my dog, <laughs> and I'm doing stuff with them, and I'm or I, yeah, there's, there's loads of things that make me happy. I like going to the football. I like playing football. I like boxing. Mm -hmm. I like doing positive stuff. And I like helping people, but I think what makes me happier than anything else is when other people say to me, cheers for that, mate. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it fills me with pride. I could, I'm not going to do it, but I could show you the messages I've got on my phone from people who've, who've, who've been inspired by stuff that I've done, and that fucking makes me proud. That makes me fucking... Do you know what I mean? And if there was only one of them, well, there's only fucking one of them. Who cares? Do you know what I mean? I've, mm. I've helped someone. Do you, do you know think I mean? you've healed <laughs> from the past yet? Or do you think you still struggle with it? No, no. I think I'm, I'm in a I'm in a good space. I'm in a, I'm in a happy place now. It's, it's all. It, it, there's nothing that there's nothing that I've done that ain't out there now. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I'm glad. I couldn't care anymore. Do you know what I mean? You got nothing now. There's nothing. There's nothing for me to suppress myself with, because it's all out there. It's all spoken about. It's all talked about. It's there. Do you know what I mean? To somebody. Do you know what I mean? Wendy, you know, even you know your podcast here. It's out there. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? And if one person can take any of the lessons from my life and turn it to advantage in theirs, I'm a fucking happy man, I'll tell you that. What's the biggest life lesson you've learnt? <sighs> Probably to speak out and never give up. I say this, I say never give up and it's a sort of like thing, but whatever you've got, whatever you can look down and see your chest rise and fall, you've got a fucking chance at something. No matter what's happened to you. You know, and I've spoken to people like Mark Ormer or triple amputees, you know what I mean, who've, who've been through horrendous stuff and gone, fucking hell. He looks down at his chest and he goes, fucking, it's still working, I've got a chance here. And then he's rolling around on the fucking mat, giving it jujitsu and all that stuff, you know what I mean? There's always a chance for everybody. Do you know what I mean? There's always a chance. Whatever that thing's going up and down, do you know what I mean? There's a chance. Yeah, and I've heard Toby. He gets shot through the neck. What a great guy. <sighs> spoke, spoke Toby the other week. What I a great love guy. Love him, mate. Love what a great, him. And, and, he's, and he's been there. What is left for me? Can't move. What is left for me? Do you know what I mean? It's like, there's fucking loads left for you, Toby. Just speaking to Toby makes me fucking, makes me fucking glow. I interviewed him two years ago yeah. and I just, I love it, I love it, my bits, just the yeah. way he kicks on and he just fucking tries to do his thing. What an example, what yeah. an example to people. What, what, wrong model, right there. Do you know what I mean? Unbelievable. Toby, wow, what a guy. Fucking you know I mean? love him. What a great guy. How's life now? All right. You know, we're doing my radio station, doing my podcast, doing this, doing that, doing the other. We're, we're promote everything now. What right, okay, so Force Radio is, is my radio station. Um, Force One, Force Anthems and Force Classics. Three, three different genres of music. Um, and encompassed in that, we've got a podcasting thing, the Debrief Podcast, which is mine, which is, mm -hmm. that's doing all right, chasing you, mate. <laughs> Anytime, listen, I'm happy to I'm fucking help you. you. <laughs> good, mate. If anybody's going to do it, I hope it's you, big man. Yeah, so, no, I'm not, look, I'm enjoying it. I'll do, I'll do my after dinners. I'm, I'm a, I'm a ambassador for the military preparation training colleges, which is, I do a load of stuff for them. I'm in and out of army camps all the time. You've got your books. I've got my books, yeah. Like to do my books. Uh, my books get me on the cruise line. Like, <laughs> <laughs> How was it writing your first book? Again, I get on really well with. So I, I, I did it through a ghostwriter. I'm not going to pretend that I can write a book because I can't. All right, but I did it through a ghostwriter, Damien Lewis. Done it, done it on the piss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that first my Bob Fearless was written in a pub in Ireland. <laughs> a proper bang on it, like do you know what I mean? I was like, I really, 
I got everything out, but I had to write the second book because I, I, at the time I wrote Born Fearless, I hadn't, I hadn't had this epiphany. I hadn't got everything out. Do you know what I mean? I was so desperate to fucking get it out when I was talking to Damien the first time. I was like, but I can't say that. And people are just going to think, I can't. I don't care if they think that now. I genuinely don't. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I, I know I'm not. <laughs> Have you ever been suicidal, Phil? Yeah. Yeah, I've been in there. I've looked at it. I've thought about it. I've, I've, I've envisaged it. I've envisaged it. I've, I've, I've worked out how I could do it. Do you know what I mean? And I just, I can't bring myself to it. Just every time I've sort of had this thing where I've gone, nah, not this time. Nah, nah, give it another go. It's a chance, isn't it? There's a chance. It, it's, it's, a, it's a sad day. It's a sad day that people, I, I, I really, I can't, I don't even like to say the word. I call it the S word. I don't even like the word. I don't like, I don't, I don't really like talking about it. But again, it's one of those things people, it's so sad. It's just horrendous. And I, I've, I, you know, the first the first person I knew that committed suicide was in a children's home years ago. I've had it all my life. People committing suicide around me. Do you know what I mean? People I've known, people I've liked, respected, loved. I've done it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's horrendous. It's horrendous thing to do. And I've thought about it myself. And it, it, uh, luckily, you know, I can handle heart. Every time I've got to that stage, I've gone. Ah, nah, 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 nah. Nah. It's too much. It's too much to keep going for. Yeah, the people who do that for me, listen. I, f I wish it wouldn't happen, but it's so brave to fucking then decide. Okay, this is enough's enough. And it breaks hard. It would get to that stage with anybody, but <sighs> yeah. I, I don't know. It's just horrendous. I can't. It's it's what you leave behind as well, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? I, you know, my children. You know, we're all going to have to accept one day that we're going to get a piece of news that we don't like, aren't we? We're going to have to accept that it's going to happen. Do you know what I mean? And the lights are going to go out one final time. And you can accept that to a certain extent because it's written in your fucking, it's written in your story, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? But when it's accelerated by yourself and your children have got to think, well, no, just, it, it's not for me. It's, it's just not, I, I, that's how I thought about it. I've envisaged it. I've worked out how I could do it. I couldn't, couldn't do it. Why do you think you're still here? I've got unfinished business, mate. I've got stuff to do. I've got stuff to do, mate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just before we finish up, brother, I know you've came through your struggles, and uh, yeah, it's a difficult time for people. And uh, uh, the majority of people do struggle. I think everybody struggles because they don't really understand life to the full potential. And it's sad because people have got so much potential to do amazing things, but they just don't have that inner belief. And I know a lot of people do struggle, battle, and would kind of go for the external things to then put the plaster over the pain, but your prime example of speaking out, it took you 47 years. Yeah. Did you see speaking out changing your whole outlook in life? Yeah, it did, absolutely did. Changed me completely as a person as well. I just, you know, for once in my life, I felt like there was nothing being hidden. Do you know what I mean? I'm holding on to something that I don't want inside. Do you know what I mean? And that's how I felt with it, especially with the, with the, with the nonsense stuff. Do you know what I mean? I, I held that in for a long time. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't feel like I could speak to anybody about it. Like I said, I, I I felt embarrassed, not not because it happened. I couldn't give a shit what happened. Do you know what I mean? In fact, you know, if you, you could have had a little joke, I might have even enjoyed it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right? That's wrong. But I didn't feel any any of those emotions. I felt like people would judge that I was blaming my behaviour on that, and that's the thing that made, led to me not being able to talk about it because I didn't want to be, you know, oh, he's a fucking wanker making his excuses up. Like, do you know what I mean? And it wasn't, it, it was there, it was there. It happened, it was, it was fucking horrible, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was having an impact on, on, on the way I behaved. What was it like to feel love? Obviously your missus, like, was that the first time you'd ever felt proper love? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love How being did loved. you accept that? Um, or could you accept that? Yeah, I, I, I do. It, it, real love comes from your children as well, because that's unconditional as well, isn't it? You know what I mean? So... You know, when you when you think about your children, when I think about you know my children, it, 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 you do accept. I, I, I crave love. Do you know what I mean? You want love, don't you? You want love in your life. Of course you do. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's part of the fabric of what you need. It's, it's, it's a it's almost a staple, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Anyone who says they don't want to be loved, it's a major problem going on. You're going to sort yourself out. Do you know what I mean? Because you do, don't you? Do you know what I mean? What's your plans for the future, big man? Just keep going. Do what I'm doing. Spreading the news, spreading the love, you know what I mean? And doing what I can do. I ain't going to make a massive difference to the whole world. Do you know what I mean? I ain't going to be a politician. I ain't going to be, you know, there used to be a time when because you should be a mayor of London. You should, not interested. No, 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 thing. Mm. I'm just going to do my thing, do you know what I mean? And hopefully inspire a few people along the way 
and just like I say, just just ease my way through through life as best I can and do the best I can. Do you know what I mean? Uh, just before we finish up, brother, for anybody that's watching that's maybe in that life of struggle, what advice would you have for them? Have a word with yourself. Have a word with yourself. Have a look in the mirror. There's only one person on this planet you can pull the wool over their eyes. You can't pull the wool over their eyes, you know what I mean? And that's you. All right? I can lie to you. I can tell you the biggest load of bullshit. I can lie to him. I can lie to her. I can lie to them. I can't lie. When I look in the mirror, I can't tell any lies. When I look in that mirror and I look at myself, I can't act. You fucking know, don't you feel? You fucking know, don't you? You can't. You know what I mean? You know, all right? I can't lie to myself, can I? I can't lie to myself, all right? So if you're struggling, if you're really struggling, have a word with yourself. Have a word with yourself. People say you're mad if you talk to yourself. I'll say you're fucking mad if you don't. I really do. Have a word with yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then work out what you can do from there. Do you know what I mean? Big man, would you like to finish up on anything else? No. No. <laughs> it's, been <fun. laughs> it's been fun. Listen, f phenomenal Listen. conversation. I'm proud yeah. of you, man. Keep fucking going. Everybody that's listening, watching, go over to uh, Phil's YouTube channel. Um, just don't give them more subscribers than me, please. Um, I'm a fucking winner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, check out his Instagram. Any questions for anybody struggling, then drop him a message and no doubt he'll get back to you. Phil, I wish you nothing but the best for the future, brother. Cheers, God bro. bless you. Take care. Yeah, nice one.